Any discussion on remedies needs to start with an attempt to define what constitutes a breach of contract. A breach of contract can be summarized as the failure of a party to a contract without a lawful excuse, an example of a lawful excuse would be frustration, to perform their contractual obligations. A breach of contract gives rise to secondary obligations, to pay damages, and exceptionally, the party at fault may be forced to perform the obligation by an order of specific performance. A contract can be breached in a variety of ways. First, a party may refuse to perform all or part of the contract. For example, someone refuses to pay for goods received. Secondly, performance would be defective. Defective. For example, you order a tablet and it arrives broken. Thirdly, a party may be unable to perform the promised actions. The seller has sold the goods promised to you to somebody else. Note, however, the requirement that the failure to perform needs to be without a lawful excuse. If, for example, you refuse to pay for the order because it arrived in an unsatisfactory condition, this may not be a breach as you may have a lawful excuse. We explore this further towards the end of the lecture when we discuss the right to terminate. Who needs to prove what happened? The burden of proof is on the party alleging breach. For example, if I think you have not performed your obligation under the contract terms, I will have to prove it. How can one tell if contractual performance has fallen below what is acceptable? How does one define acceptable? Contractual performance is assessed objectively using two standards, those of strict liability and reasonable care. Strict liability. If with a contract that the party guarantees a particular result or to bring about a particular state of affairs, if performance falls short of the stipulated standard, there is a breach even if it is not the fault of the party. It is important to remember that one is not looking for moral culpability, intention or fault. An illustration is the case of Moore v. Landauer from 1921. This involved a contract to deliver 3,000 tins of fruit to be packed in cases containing 30 tins each. When some of the consignment was delivered packed in cases of 24, this was held to be a breach of contract. Even though the performance was as valuable as the one promised, it was not what was promised a buyer could reject the whole consignment. Note, however, what is known as the de minimis rule, which means that microscopic deviations from the promised performance will not constitute breach unless they come under a statutory duty to perform absolutely. See sections 13 to 15 of the Sale of Goods Act of 1979 and, and 9 to 18 of the Consumer Rights Act of 2015 on obligations as to description, fitness for purpose, satisfactory quality and correspondence with sample in sales of goods contracts. According to these provisions, no matter how slight the deviation, it will be a breach if it comes under the Acts. Reasonable When the contract does not guarantee the result, then a different standard is adopted, that the party will take reasonable care in carrying out his obligations. An example is Section 13 of the Supply of Goods and Services Act of 1982, where the supplier is acting in the course of business, there is an implied term that, the term that the supplier will carry out the service with reasonable care and skill. The standard here is still objective because the benchmark is a reasonable person in the trade under consideration. Termination. Linked to a discussion on remedies are the consequences termination can have on a contract and the parties. The effect of termination is to release both parties from the performance of obligations which were only due to be performed after the date of termination. Note that termination for breach renders the contract voidable, not void ab initio. The obligation to perform is extinguished, but an obligation to pay damages subsists. The expectation principle is still used as the basis of assessing damages, and the duty to mitigate can in practice sometimes mean that the plaintiff recontracts with the party in breach. The key points about termination are as follows. A breach does not itself terminate a contract, although all breaches entitle the other party to a remedy. Only some breaches are serious enough to allow the non-breaching party to elect to terminate the contract and seek damages if appropriate. Terminating a contract is in one sense a form of a self-help remedy because it is a way the innocent party can avoid the consequences of continued breach without the intervention of the court. However, the innocent party has to be careful because if she terminates a contract when she is not entitled to do so, then the purported termination will itself be a breach for which they will be potentially liable in damage. 
In other words, if you terminate the contract when you're not entitled to do so, then you're in breach yourself. The other party can terminate and claim remedies from you. We now move on from discussing breach of contract to remedies, starting with damages as the primary remedy for loss. Damages – Compensation for loss The most commonly used remedy for breach of contract is damages. The aim of damages is to compensate the victim of the breach, not to punish the party in breach. It is for this reason that one will not be able to obtain compensation unless they can demonstrate that they have suffered loss on account of the breach. It is also important to note that the measure of damages is not affected by the motive of the breach. This was illustrated in the case of Addis v. Gramophone in 1909, involving someone's dismissal from their employment. While the claimant did get damages for wrongful dismissal, he could not claim damages for the sharp and oppressive manner in which he was sacked. There are three main headings of damages. Expectation loss, meaning protecting the party's performance interest. Reliance loss, meaning compensating the party for what they spent. And restitution, meaning recovering the benefit given to the other party. Remember that some of the difficulty in assessing loss does not mean that the claimant loses his right to damages, unless the loss depends entirely on remote and hypothetical possibilities. For example, in Chaplin v. Hicks from 1911, the difficulty in assessing damages for the loss of the chance to win a beauty contest was not considered a bar to the claim as real loss had been suffered. We will now consider each of the headings of damages in turn. Expectation loss. Awarding damages for expectation loss means compensating the party for the loss of his expectations. What would the party gain from the performance of the contract if the breach had not occurred? In Robinson v. Harman from 1848, the judge said that the rule of the common law is that where a party sustains a loss by reason of a breach of contract, he is, as far as money can do it, to be placed in the same situation with respect to damages as if the contract had been performed. This leads to the next question, which is what to claim and how to claim it. In Parsons v. Atley from 1978, a farm bought some equipment to store food and use it to feed their pigs. Because of the way it was installed, a ventilator was left closed, the feed went bad and the pigs got sick. The claimed compensation was for loss of the profits from having lost the pigs. There are a number of ways in which to calculate the loss claimed in such a case. Loss of promised performance, meaning not getting a, a functioning pig feeder. Consequential loss, which could mean the dead pigs, the farm being made worse off. Or consequential loss in the sense that the profits that would have been made from the sale of the pigs have been lost. The farm was not being made better off. There are two main measures of damages for expectation loss, difference in value and the cost of cure. Difference in value. A common way to calculate the loss a party suffers on the breach is to determine what the party would earn from the performance of the contract if it had been promised and deducting what the party actually got. Promised performance minus actual gain equals the amount lost due to the breach. Remember that the starting point in determining what will be compensated is that compensation will cover the minimum obligation undertaken. This means that you will receive damages, for example, for the minimum gain you would have made out of the contract, not for the eventuality that you might be fantastic successful. This leads us to the next question, which is how do you determine what the party would get? One way is to use the market price rule. What do we mean by market price? The first step is to determine the relevant market. When the seller is offering goods for sale and there is a buyer, the transaction is taken as characteristic of the market. When there is no buyer but there are other traders, information from other transactions can be used to determine the market. The second step is to determine the price. This could be a fair price determined by actual trade or the price that people would pay on that day for the goods or services. For example, let us imagine in a situation where we agree that I sell you flowers to make flower arrangements. Because the flowers I gave you are substandard, your arrangements are of a lesser value. How much money have you lost? What is in this case the relevant market? It would be independent contractors doing that sort of job, meaning sellers of fresh furs. What is the price? What these people would normally charge for a similar job. In other words, what would be the price of goods similar to those you ordered? However, the difference in value measure may not always be satisfactory. 
For instance, what if there is no market? For example, when goods are manufactured especially for the buyer, such as spacecraft made for NASA, there may not be a market to discover prices in. In this case, the court itself will estimate the price. Also, if the goods are defective but are still retained and used by the buyer, there may not be a market for defective goods of that nature. In these cases, it is necessary, necessary to consider alternative ways of assessing damages. Cost of cure. The difference in value measure, as we saw, examines what valuable performance one did receive and how different it is from the one he was promised. The cost of cure measure denotes the excess utility or subjective value over and above the market value of contracted for, which would have been secured had the contract been properly performed. In other words, the cost of cure measure asks, how can the defective performance be fixed? How can you get what you bargained for? You may think at this point that if difference in value is available, the cost of cure is irrelevant. Why bother having, dif why bother having different measures if both measures are available, aren't they the same? The results of calculations could be the same depending on circumstances. For instance, as in the above example, if we agree that I sell you flowers for £5,000 for you to make flower arrangements to sell, because the flowers I gave you are substandard, worth only 4000 your arrangements are of a reduced value. A diminution in value measure would calculate the price of what you should get minus what you got, 5000 minus 4000 equals 1000 Estimate how to fix the problem, meaning bringing the flowers up to the expected standard. £1,000, say to add more quality flowers, so the result would be the same in both cases. But see the following. In Jacobs v. Kent in 1921, work was carried out in a building and the owner wanted the plumbing to be carried out using a specific type of pipes. The builder used another type of pipe that was just as good, that was just as good but the owner sued in breach of contract. The court said that yes, this is a breach of contract because the performance needs to match the contractual specification and it's not up to the builder to substitute the promised items with things he thinks are just as good. However, awarding the cost of cure would be vast rent from awarding the difference in value. In Tito v. Waddell, 1977, a company was granted a license to mine on an island and undertook the obligation to restore the area afterwards. They did not do it and were sued. The diminution in value for plots of land was minimal as the island was not inhabited, but the cost of returning the island to its original condition would have been huge. The islanders in this case lost. As the differences can be significant then, how does one choose between the two measures? It could be that statute decides. For example, the Landlord and Tenant Act of 1927 determines that, tenants, uh, that the tenant's covenant, to re covenant to repair is assessed on the basis of diminution in value. The Sale of Goods Act 1979 in section 53 says that diminution in value is the measure for defective goods. Also, case law could determine. The cost of cure is the appropriate measure for building contracts when reasonable. We now, move, we now move on to the second method of calculating damages, that is, reliance. Reliance loss. What is reliance loss? When expectation loss is too speculative, for example, it cannot be proved what you lost from the defective performance, or when you have no loss of profits, you can claim for what you spent in performing your side of the contract. An example is the case of McRae v. Commonwealth Disposals from 1951. The Commonwealth Disposals Commission sold its rights to a tanker that had sunk. It provided the claimant with the details of where the tanker was and according to the contract, McRae could keep whatever he could salvage. McRae could not find the ship because it was not at the where the commission said it was. In this case, the claimant could not prove what he lost from the breach because there was no way to tell how much value lay in the tanker. So the only things left to claim were the money paid for the rights to the non-existing tanker and the expenses in mounting the salvage expedition. What can you claim for under the reliance loss heading? It is possible to claim for both pre- and post-contractual expenditure depending on the circumstances. Pre-contractual expenditure. In Anglia TV versus Reed in 1972, it was held that the case of wrongful repudiation of a contract allowed the agreed party to claim by way of damages not only expenses 
incurred after the contract, but also pre-contractual expenditure within, within the reasonable contemplation of the parties. In Anglia, a well-known actor contracted to appear for Anglia Television to play the lead in a play they were producing. Shortly afterwards, he wrongly repudiated the contract and Anglia Television were forced to abandon the production. Anglia Television claimed a total wasted expenditure, but contended that they were entitled only to their expenditure after the contract was concluded. The court found that the plaintiffs could claim expenditure incurred before the contract provided it was reasonably in the contemplation of the parties as likely to be wasted if the contract were broken. It is important to note firstly that Anglia was claiming reliance loss because they could not prove what their profits from the production of the film would have been. Secondly, pre-contractual expenditure can be claimed if he was within the contemplation of the parties. Does the claimant have completely free choice between expectation and reliance laws? In Anglia, Lord Denning suggested that the claimant needs to make a selection whether he asks, asks for his expectation or reliance laws. This has caused some controversy, but it appears that what Denning meant by this was that the claimant should not be allowed to claim for the same loss twice. Expectation loss will normally involve a claim for gross profits the victim of the breach get from the performance of the contract. This will include already an assessment of the expenses incurred by the claimant. Further, the courts do not offer compensation for the consequences of bad bargains. As in CNP Holland v Middleton in 1983, if someone would have lost money out of a deal anyway, anyway, they're not entitled to claim the expenses incurred as a result of making the contract. The reason is that this would compensate them at the respondent's expense for the bad bargain they had made and would leave them better off than they would have been had the contract been wholly performed. A significant question that arises from the above is who needs to, who needs to prove losses. In principle, the claimant is free to quantify his loss on an expectation or on a reliance basis and has to prove the loss he is claiming. However, if the respondent is claiming that this is a bad bargain and it should not be compensated, like in CNP, then the burden of proof shifts to the defendant. Finally, when do we start assessing damages? The usual time for the assessment of the loss is when the performance became due but did not take place. In other words, the relevant time is the date of breach. We now move on to a series of remedies that come under the broad heading of restitution. Restitutionary remedies. Restitution generally defined allows the victim of a breach to recover the benefit passed to the defendant. A difference between restitution and the other two measures, expectation loss and reliance loss, arises in the case of total failure of consideration. In this respect, this can be a more complete measure of compensation because it allows total recovery of the benefit passed to the defendant. Thus, the claimant gets back the value of his performance regardless of whether that is the whole loss. It usually applies to payments of money for nothing in return. What happens, however, if we are not in the domain of total, total failure, yet there is no obvious loss? We have already seen that the principle in Addis versus Gramophone is that compensation for breach of contract is compensation for loss, not punishing the defendant or compensating for disappointment. There are, however, cases when the breach results in loss that is not measurable under the, under the two principles mentioned in our discussion of expectation loss, diminution in value and the cost of cure. Also, there are cases where the loss is not adequately represented by the use of one of those two measures because something more is being lost. These cases are known as involving non-pecuniary loss, a loss not measured in money. The general rule is that damages for anguish and vexation were not recoverable when they arose out of a purely commercial contract. Only claims for physical inconvenience, not mere disappointment, have historically been accepted by the courts. An example is the case of Watts versus Morrow from 1991. The plaintiffs, who were husband and wife, acquired the property as a second home and had required that it should be reasonably trouble-free without any need for extensive repairs. The surveyor's report indicated that the defects mentioned in the report could be dealt with as part of ordinance. However, the plaintiffs discovered costly defects be beyond those disclosed in the defendant's report.
The court found that the financial loss of the plaintiffs was limited to the difference between the value of the property as it was presented to be and its value in its true condition, and also that damages were recoverable for distress and inconvenience caused by physical consequences of the breach of contract. Damages for disappointment will only be recoverable for select cases of special contracts, whose purpose in includes pleasure, as for example holiday contracts. See Jarvis v. Swan Tours from 1973. Th things become more complicated if one is trying to claim non-pecuniary losses for commercial contracts given the historical hostility of the courts as mentioned earlier. What happens then when the victim suffers no loss but the defendant is making a profit from the breach? An example is the case of Surrey County Council versus Bredero Homes in, from 1993, where the court held that when a breach of contract caused no loss to the plaintiff, the appropriate award was nominal damages, meaning no compensation of any real value. However, there are some mechanisms that will prevent the perpetrator of a breach from gaining one just reward. One such mechanism is an account of profits, as seen in Attorney General v. Blake from 2001. The case involved a former member of the Secret Intelligence Services, SIS, who later became a Soviet agent in violation of his contractual obligations to the British government. He wrote a book and entered into an agreement with a UK publisher. The Crown claimed whatever payments were due from the publishers. The court held that in exceptional cases, where normal remedies were inadequate to compensate for breach of contract, it was open to the court to order that the defendant account for all profits either received or to which he is entitled. He is entitled. Therefore, an account of profits is only considered when no other remedy is available. It requires a special relationship between the parties, for example fiduciary, and the fact that the breach is a cynical, deliberate, was made to profit the defendant is not enough. The test emerging for Blake is, did the plaintiff have a legitimate interest in preventing the defendant's profit-making activity and depriving him of his profit? A slightly easier way around this problem would be to consider how much money would the plaintiff have asked for to allow the action that now constitutes the breach. This is described as a hypothetical and illustrated by the case of Rotham Park versus Parkside Homes from 1974. We now move on to consider remedies other than monetary amounts, meaning damages. Specific performance. As we have seen, damages are the main means of compensation for breach of contract. In exceptional cases, however, the court may order specific performance. This means order the party in breach to perform the contractual obligation. Specific performance is a remedy at the discretion of the court, only awarded when, when damages are an inadequate remedy. The burden of proof is on the victim of the breach to establish that damages are not enough to compensate for the loss suffered. Why would damages not be enough? Normally, a monetary amount representing the loss will suffice to cover the loss. However, this assumes that, for instance, the victim of the breach can purchase some substitute performance. When substitute performance is unavailable, one may consider an order of specific performance as the only way to effectively deal with the breach. An example is the case of Sky Petroleum vs. VIP from 1974. Dur during the oil crisis of the 1970s, the claimant had contract contracted to buy fuel at fixed prices for a 10-year period. When the respondent wrongfully terminated the contract, the court held that damages would not be enough to compensate. Even though petrol is not unique, since it was difficult to come by during that period, monetary compensation would be inadequate in compensating the claimant for his loss. Could the parties agree on future potential damages? The next part of the discussion deals with this issue. Agreed damages we have discussed in the context of remedies that the purpose of an award of damages is to compensate the victim of the breach for his loss, not to punish the defendant. Is it possible then to have penalty clauses inserted into contracts? Penalty clauses interpreted as a punishment for the contracting party in case of breach of contract will not be enforceable. However, if the clause is interpreted as a liquidated damages clause, it will be enforceable as an assessment of the damage that will arise from the breach of contract. For example, in Dunlop v. New Garage from 1915, Dunlop was selling tires to the garage and there was a term in the contract that prohibited the garage from selling them for less than the list price. 
There was also a clause that if the contract was breached, the garage would pay a fixed amount for each item sold to compensate Dunlop by way of liquidated damages. The court held this was an acceptable pre-estimate of the loss and not a clause intended to punish the defendant in case of breach as a penalty clause. The court highlighted that the label used by the parties for the clause is not conclusive and that the liquidated damages clause is supposed to be a genuine pre-estimate of damages. Liquidated damages, or agreed damages, are not to be confused with an action for an agreed sum. This denotes the situation where the claimant is asking for the contract price after having performed his obligation under the contract. The benefit of this action is that it is not subject to the limiting doctrines we will discuss in a moment. Limiting doctrines Things like losses of profits we have discussed before are called in the literature consequential losses. How to choose what to include in a damages claim is very important and can have very serious financial consequences. Limitations to the kinds of damages available include causation, remiss, mitigation, contributory negligence and kind of loss, meaning that some types of loss are not available, for example compensation for mental distress in commercial contracts as we saw above. We will in turn discuss causation, remoteness and mitigation. Causation. Only losses that are causally connected to the breach can be claimed. For example, if I miss a flight because I was late arriving at the airport as I was at home trying to get my laptop to switch on, I cannot pass on the cost of a replacement flight to the seller of the laptop even if it can be proved that the laptop was substandard in violation of the contract of sale. How much of a connection is needed is explained by the detailed rules on remoteness. Remoteness. The key case on remoteness is the case of Hadley v. Baxendale from 1854. Hadley was the owner of a mill. He contracted with Baxendale for him to carry a part of the machine in the mill to an engineer to fix. Baxendale was late in delivering to the engineer and the mill had to stay closed for an extra five days. Hadley claimed loss of profits for the five days that the mill was closed. The court held that the resulting loss of profits was too remote a consequence and therefore not recoverable. The court presented the test for allowing consequential loss as a two-part question. First, is the loss arising naturally from the breach? Or, second, was the loss within the contemplation of the parties? If it arises naturally, then the loss is recoverable. If it does not arise naturally, then the loss is only recoverable if the possibility was known to the parties. But where do you draw the line? A good example is the case of Victoria Laundry v. Newman from 1949. Victoria bought a large boiler from Newman. The boiler was in Newman's shop and had to be disassembled and sent to Victoria. It got seriously damaged during removal and it was five months delayed in reaching Victoria. Victoria included in the claim for loss of profits the lost chance of having a very lucrative contract with the Ministry of Supply. The court held that profits from the government contract were too remote. In summarizing the law, the court found the following. The principle of damages is to put the party in the position he would have been had the contract been performed. Expectation loss. This principle, pursued without qualification, would result however in unfairness to the defendant. In cases of breach, therefore, the victim can only recover losses reasonably foreseeable as liable to result from the breach. What is reasonably foreseeable depends on the knowledge of the parties. Knowledge for this purpose is of two kinds. First, imputed, reasonable assumption that you can foresee things occurring in the ordinary course of things, which is the first part of the Hadley test. And second, actual knowledge outside the ordinary course of things, which is the second part of the Hadley test. The final limiting doctrine we will discuss is mitigation. Mitigation. The victim of a breach is under an obligation to mitigate his losses. If he fails to do so, then the damages award will be reduced accordingly. This means simply that the breach does not give the victim a license to spend. Therefore, the claimant needs to take reasonable steps to minimize his loss, but these steps need only be reasonable. The claimant is not expected to go out of his way to make it easier for the perpetrator of the breach. An example of the rule in operation is the case of British Westinghouse Electric Underground from 1912.